Hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? I'm really good. I'm I'm having fun. I'm looking forward to our episode today. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's some exciting stuff coming on with the podcast. We got a new sponsor coming our way, uh, in addition to our existing sponsor. Um, but uh, it's the time of the year where everybody's kind of, uh, you know, looking around and saying, you know, uh, things are new, and you know, we've got new residents have been in for a while. Fellows are kind of in their second month now. Um, have you had any good discussions with them about your favorite topic, coding? Well, fellows are in their second week. Let's not give them too much uh, street cred. Um, they. I was trying. I was trying to be anticipatory of that. This is going to drop in September. <laughs> Okay, we'll just we'll just roll with that. Um, you know, I I haven't talked about coding um, yet with fellows. What's been interesting is no one wants to talk about coding until they have to talk about coding. And so, even in the early part of the year, I don't think fellows really care. Even if we ask them to do some coding and they do some coding this year, they don't do a ton of it. I talk about it throughout the year. They they get nervous in June, and then they yeah, exactly. want a coding lecture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember uh, feeling nervous about it, but then also kind of knowing this, I, mean, I don't know, I mean, I guess knowing I was going into academics and just kind of, it didn't really matter as much to me, uh, but I think that it really matters to those that are going into a, you know, private practice type job or any kind of job where, you know, some academic places, you're, the coding you do yourself is pretty, or at least the guidance you give the coders is super important. Um, you know, I honestly have probably left a lot of RVUs slash dollars on the table because of my uh, ineptness with coding. It is it is interesting. I think in 2023, we all should be highly aware of the codes. I mean, A, it's the law. But, but aside from that, you know, we are responsible for what goes in. But to your point, if you have really good coders on your team, you're probably okay. Maybe there's a, some missed opportunity. If you dictate well and know what to, the lingo to put in your dictation and you have professional coders working for you, that can help. But if you don't have that, you really need to learn how to code because it is absolutely money on the table. Yeah, and, and I guess this is a very American-centric discussion because I think in uh, you know other parts of the world, the healthcare systems uh, work differently, perhaps better. Uh, <laughs> I listen to a, a different podcast all the time called Pivot, and uh, uh, Scott Galloway talks a lot about how healthcare in the U.S. is just such an opportunity for disruptive innovation because you know it's such a behemoth in terms of cost, and most people are not satisfied with their healthcare. Oh, it's it's yeah. We we could talk for many episodes about the debacle that is Amer American healthcare and uh, the coding part. It you know I actually do enjoy some aspects of of coding. It's interesting. We in the department have talked about are we doing it the right way? Uh, because most of our physicians don't daily engage in the coding process. Is that right? Is that wrong? I recently had the opportunity to use Codex, which is the Orthopedic Academy's coding platform. I was honestly disappointed. I hope I don't make anybody mad by saying that. It, it was basically the same as a spreadsheet I have in Excel. And so, I don't know. I, I uh, it, it does seem a little weird that in 2023, we're using, you know, very simplistic, trying to apply simplistic codes to complicated procedures. And there's got to be a better way. And we aren't there yet. I'm telling you, AI. AI is going to take whatever we document and should be able to uh, uh, to code. And uh, But I guess. As you said, you know, we're, you know, legally we're responsible, but I think that's a huge opportunity, um, you know, for uh, 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 for generative AI to really pick up on how to code properly and, and how to not leave, you know, uh, opportunities uh, on the table. Uh, we actually had a listener, a listener's coder emailed my admin asking how I code certain procedures that we've talked about on the podcast. Um, and uh, so I thought that was, that was an interesting part of it. Um, you know, were there any particular parts of coding that you wanted to discuss today other than just giving me a general rant? No, it, it was interesting because there's some thought that each of our surgeons should code their, his or her own cases. And I, I, I do that anyways, personally, I, I may be nearly alone in the department in, in that philosophy. Um, and our coders are really good. And they're not 100%, but they're really good. And to me, like, I think there's some people who are listening to us right now thinking that you and I are both crazy for not coding every single case ourselves and making sure we get it correct. And I I can't disagree with them. Um, I think that is really important. If you don't, and to the trainees or, or to the students, if you don't decide to go into a situation where you're coding yourself, you still have to understand it because the lingo matters. 
what you say affects what you get paid. Right, right, right. Yeah, I probably am crazy uh, <laughs> for, for not paying more attention. I think an interesting experiment for anybody who wants to do it would be to, you know, have a surgeon A code their own list and surgeon B not code their own list and see what uh, what what you come up with and what actually gets billed, et cetera. I always thinking like a research study designer. I love it. Have to, have to. So hopefully somebody does that and tells us about it because that's not anything I'm going to be doing anytime soon. So if you are out there and we are filling you with outrage about missed opportunity on coding, email us, please yeah. interact with us. Yeah. Tell us, tell us handpodcast at gmail.com. And if uh, your argument is compelling enough, we'll have you come on the podcast and uh, teach us how to code and teach us how, where we're leaving opportunities on the table. Cause I guarantee you, like you're saying, there are some listeners saying these academic guys, they have no idea what they're, uh, what they're missing out on. But uh, I think there's probably some bias in how I ended up in academics, uh, nutty professor kind of thing. Yeah, you um, I want to make sure you're feeling OK. You don't don't look your usual energetic self. Should we talk a little about nerve Would that? Would that boost your spirits? We should. But before we should thank our uh, our first sponsor, um, the upper hand is sponsored by PracticeLink.com, the most widely used physician job search and career advancement resource. Becoming a physician is hard. Finding the right job doesn't have to be. Join Practice Link for free today at www.practicelink.com backslash the upper hand. Yes, yes, check it out. And I, you know, a few episodes back, Megan Contimika talked about uh, uh, you know, her job search and everything. And I'm sure uh, you know, uh, like she said, having all those resources in one spot is going to be helpful. So, and you can find a job where you have to do your own coding. I'm sure <laughs> most jobs probably require it but yes let's talk a little bit about nerve we had a case that was sent in um by a friend of the podcast and uh you know andy's been a listener for a long time uh, i just want to pull that up here sorry i have it shall i read it yeah yeah why don't you read it okay um and, and note uh, dr nelson did not send this to me this was specifically to chris <laughs> so we'll let him run with this but uh uh, this is a case of a 58-year-old hairdresser, dominant hand, spaghetti wrist. My question is, what is the current best literature and thus CW for median nerve repair? What's CW? I don't know. Should we edit this? Just start again. I, can, I have it up. I can just present All right, it. you do it. <laughs> this episode is going sideways. Uh, so we have a, a great case that was sent in uh, by a friend of the podcast, uh, Dr. Andy Nelson. And, um, you know, he brings a case of a woman who's uh, in her 50s uh, and is a hairdresser and uh, has a median nerve injury um, from uh, uh, on the dominant hand. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways in which you can handle the median nerve. For those of you that don't know what a spaghetti wrist is, a spaghetti wrist is when you've got multiple tendons and likely nerve and artery uh, lacerated in the distal forearm. Um, you know, so something that comes up, I learned when I was in India that they call this a full house, not a spaghetti wrist. Um, but, uh, you know, inevitably you've got, you know, a, you know probably a, a median nerve that is completely lacerated or partially lacerated, which is also an interesting discussion. Um, but in this particular case, Andy talks about a median nerve that is completely lacerated and sends a nice picture of the wrist in neutral. And before freshening up the ends, he's probably got already, uh, you know, a, uh, a centimeter gap. And once you freshen that back, that's going to end up being probably a, a two and a half uh, centimeter, three centimeter gap um, with the wrist in neutral. So, Chuck, how would you think about this case uh, just in general? You know, the the mechanism of injury really matters because that will as does the acuity um because that'll affect how much nerve you need to resect to have bulging fascicles to maximize your potential for recovery and so the first step is you know thorough debridement um i typically in general repair tendons first and save the nerve uh, that also takes a little tension off the field which can be helpful and then i i try to mobilize the nerve without devascularizing the nerve and once I've done my resections, I just, you know, stop and take a look and decide what the next step is. Absolutely agree with that. So I like tendons, tendons first, repair tendons as you go, save the micro for last. So if you're doing, if you're going to do the artery, usually the hand is perfuse, but if you're doing the radial or ulnar artery as bonus micro, it's like great for beginning of the year, uh, fellow micro training, because it's a nice 
big juicy vessel and they get some reps on the scope and practicing their um, anastomoses and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, tendons first. And I, you know, I, as much as I like the whole tidy, like, you know, um, tag everything as you go and like, you know, identify, just repair them as you go. Cause otherwise you're just going to get caught. And this is not the beautiful, you know, modified winters, Gelberman, eight strand flexor tendon repair. You're in the forearm. You can go nuts with some bigger sutures and just get it done. Um, you know, so I think that that helps, you know, for case uh, expedition. And then before we talk about the actual kind of nerve, uh, uh, decision making we should thank our new sponsor yes we should the upper hand is sponsored by checkpoint surgical welcome checkpoint a provider of innovative solutions for peripheral nerve surgery through its nerve master educational programs the company is committed to engaging thought leaders to develop lead and support peripheral nerve surgery education so on October 13 and 14, Checkpoint is co-hosting the Ohio State University, the Ohio State University's uh, first annual combined fellows and practicing surgeons, nerve tendon and functional reconstruction course. Guys, that is a mouthful. The course faculty includes our friend Amy Moore, who's been on the pod, um, Dr. Sonny Jane, Dr. Kyle Evelyn, Dr. Uh, Jason Souza. Uh, to learn more about the program and to register, visit nervemaster.com. And the link will also be in our podcast episode description here for the upper hand. And Checkpoint Surgical, driving innovation in nerve surgery. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a nerve guy. I do use Checkpoint. I have a case this coming week that I'm excited about. So uh, I appreciate them signing on, and uh, hopefully it can be a win-win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that being said, uh, in this particular case, probably not one which I would use a Checkpoint. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, didn't plan it that way. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes in like, uh, if you get there really early, um, that may have a role before Valerian degeneration kicks in, but that's usually not the case um, in terms of identifying targets. Um, I was having this discussion about, you know, how to identify, you know, uh, if you're doing a group fascicular nerve for an ulnar nerve, um, you know, some of the old school techniques were to keep the patient awake and use a stimulator on the proximal end of the nerve to help differentiate sensory versus motor. Um, that uh, is a technique. I don't think that is used very often anymore, but uh, uh, perhaps we'll have a role. But, you know, uh, backtracking back to our median nerve laceration in the distal forearm, just proximal to the wrist crease, anticipated two and a half to three centimeter gap with the wrist in neutral. I actually had a case like this recently, Andy, um, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to primarily repair the nerve. I really, really wanted to. The patient really did not want uh, a nerve uh, harvest, um, and I tried. And, you know, we, at the most I will flex the wrist for something like this would be about 30 degrees because I think that's the most you can ask, uh, you know, of a dorsal blocking splint without creating any issues. So if you are going to go the path of doing that, it is high risk, high reward and work from many others, but also most recently uh, our partner, David Brogan has shown that if you repair the nerve primarily and it's under a little bit of tension, it, it'll be great if it works, if it ruptures, you're completely out of luck. So, you know, I think that is the challenge here. Are you willing to take that risk? Do you trust the patient? Uh, do you, are you willing to roll the dice? And for me, that situation rarely comes up where I'm actually able to primarily repair the nerve. Um, and then if you do primarily repair the nerve, I think, you know, kind of moving slowly over, you know, six to eight weeks to get the wrist out of that kind of slightly flexed position. And I've used ultrasound in some cases to monitor the nerve coaptation. I think ultrasound is not great at telling you if the nerve is, uh, if nerve regeneration is occurring. It's it's okay at telling you whether there's frank discontinuity, um, because whatever your repair, you know, whatever repair you have, you're going to have um, some sort of pseudo neuroma formation because you never get it perfectly repaired. So there'll, there'll be some enlargement. You can only tell whether that thing is split apart or not. And at that point, it's too late. So that was a mouthful. How do you think about it, Chuck? You know, simplistically every one of us is tempted to go for the primary repair because it's better, right? It's only one um, junction to heal. And if you can get away with it, of course we should do that. It's faster, potentially better. But the reality is, and this is hard. This is hard in the middle of the night. It's hard at the end of a long day. If there's a two to a half to three centimeter gap, I don't think a primary repair is typically the right thing to do. And, you know, you have to bear in mind the, the ramifications of this repair. It's the freaking median nerve in the forearm. You got to do the best you can do 
for the patient. And I'm certainly not being critical of anyone, but you have to, I think, I think, and I, and I, I've been guilty of really trying to cut corners. You shouldn't do it. Right. Absolutely. And then, you know, I think if you're looking at a nerve repair and you're trying to figure out whether the coaptation is going to, is under too much tension or not, I think using a single 9 nylon is probably the the cleanest way to do it. I think that the 8 nylon test has been described. There's some work out of Indiana showing that a 9 nylon suture, one suture is probably better in terms of matching the appropriate resting tension of the nerve. Um, so I tend to use 9 nylon, although, you know, again, when you're trying to rationalize or justify a decision, you've got, you know, you're holding the nerve together and the fellow's putting in or your assistant is holding the nerve and you're putting in an 8 nylon and maybe two and trying to see. But, you know, I think it's, it's again, while it's really tempting, don't fool yourself. And that's what we did in that case recently is that we, you know, I had a very skilled fellow working with me at the end of the year and we were like, let's try to get this repair. And, and we both, we looked at ourselves and we're like, well, who are we getting here? So we went and harvested from the leg. All right, I'm going to give you a challenge. In two sentences max, tell me why tension is bad. So tension's bad because if you have excessive tension, it's going to cause ischemia, and ischemia will stop nerve regeneration. And then the second sentence is that if you if it is under too much tension, it may also just rupture. Bravo. So Yeah, there you go. I didn't think you had it in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been blabbering since this is my favorite topic. Um, but the other questions that Andy asks are, you know, so aside from what size suture, what the test, you know, so if you do get it together, I think you have to be honest with yourself and passively extend the wrist to about 30 degrees. You can't just put it in neutral. And if it, if it shows signs of gapping, uh, just take it down. Um, but honestly, by, by the time you freshen the ends on these, usually it retracts a little bit and you're just not able to get it. Uh, put together properly. Now, if you're there sooner after the the injury itself, if you're there pretty quickly, I think you've got a really good chance. But the longer you wait, the more likely it's going to retract on you. And uh, um, you know, like you said, this this is a nice little pearl you mentioned. You know, sometimes getting the um, depending on where the nerve is injured, sometimes getting the tendons repair it helps because as as many of you know, the median nerve tends to hug that kind of epimysium of the muscle um, of the FDS, and sometimes that kind of brings it closer together. But I, I never constantly rely on that. Right, right. Okay, so you're in the OR, you've made the decision, you need a graft. Um, is this an age-based decision or is this a convenience decision? Uh, what are your choices? I think that, you know, so your choices are that you could harvest autograph from somewhere. Um, you know, I think the classic, uh, the classically described is a sural nerve, but you're in it. that's a different, yeah, that obviously has to be a discussion about donor site morbidity and you're in a different um, different extremity. And, you know, it's kind of honestly a pain in the butt to harvest a sural nerve sometimes, especially if you're on your own or if you have limited help. Um, another option would be harvesting something from the ipsilateral extremity. So something like medial endobrachial, medial brachial, LABC. Some people even say superficial radial nerve. I tend to stay away from the more causalgic nerves like an SRN. But, you know, if you do it well and take care of your proximal stump, I think those are good options that you have. The fasticular density is higher in the sural nerve, which is nice, which I think for, like you said, this is a high stakes operation. I think that that's where I would go typically. Outside of autograft, your options would be, at least in the U.S., an acellular nerve allograft, um, typically available off the shelf. Um, and I think that, you know, if there are some case series and some emerging data from prospective studies, um, which are funded by the, the group that makes the, uh, uh, pro that processes and sells the nerve allograft, that suggests that doing an allograft is just as good as doing an autograft. Um, I remain unconvinced that if this was my nerve, that that's what I would want. But I think that is a reasonable thing uh, to consider. Um, but it's not my personal preference. Um, so the if, if you're read if you're listening, the Ranger studies demonstrate that there are some cases in which this would work uh, with an a a cellular nerve allograph. But again, that's just not my personal preference. I think that uh, um, you know the standard is is tricky. Uh, because historically, uh, cable autographs have not performed very well. But I think as we become more discerning, I think if you were to look at the more recent literature, cable autographs perform okay. Yeah, I think well said. It, it is interesting how our, our field is advancing. And I, my analogy would be autograph versus allograft plugs for OATS procedures for OCDs. And uh, there is a push by industry to use allograft. And my God, the difference for both patient morbidity and surgeon convenience really favor the allograft. I just have a hard time. I, I do consider it for every case and I will use it, but 
I typically, like you, in situations like this, would favor autograph and would personally favor the Cyril Nerd. Yeah, so I mean, I'd love to hear from listeners. Uh, you know, I think that I've kind of given my stance on this at multiple venues, including on the podcast and recent episode, prior episodes, as well as um, on the podiums. But uh, I know that there are a lot of people that use a cellular nerve allograft and have had fantastic results. I, I would love it if you would share your experiences with us. Tell us on, um, and tell us about how it's gone for you, and tell me if there are papers that I need to read because you know I'm, I'm certainly open to that. Um, and the next question is whether I would wrap anything around the nerve. Um, Chuck, do you have any wraps there? Um, I I do not. And I'm pretty confident you were going to say you do not wrap the nerve ever. If I've learned anything from you, I hope I've learned correctly over the years. You do not wrap anything. Do you use to seal? Yeah. So if, I guess if we're going to be truly technical, it's an off-label use from the FDA for nerve cohabitation. But I, I use it to seal, not for anything structural. I think it, it hangs around for a couple of weeks uh, and it's gone. Um, but I think it, uh, it does help with minimizing some gapping potentially. Um, you shouldn't bank on your to seal. I know there are some places where all they do is um, you know fiber and glue, for those who are not familiar with to seal. Um, it's, uh, you know, there are some places that use only fiber and glue for nerve cooptations. I think that works in your favor, perhaps in children. Um, but uh, I don't bank on the fiber and glue as being the structural part of my uh, cooptation. I still like aligning it appropriately, tension free, um, you know, with uh, 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 with suture. And I use the, the fiber and glue to help sometimes with, you know, creating the allograft, uh, the cabled autograft, excuse me, um, with that. Um, but I don't wrap, uh, sometimes if there is a kind of question about whether it's a hostile environment for the nerve graft, I'll mobilize some of the adipofascial tissue in that area. You usually can find a nice, um, portion of the radial form, uh, fascia pedicled off of the radial artery. That's really useful to flip and turn down. And I've used that a lot in revision cases. And, and then my, maybe my last question, we're going to pivot to a far more interesting topic, uh, bones, um, how long do you, what do you tell patients? Okay, so the patient comes in, sharp laceration of the forearm. Um, you end up, you know, you're getting to it 10 days later and you end up doing a, a sural nerve autograph. What is the period of time? Do you tell them one year to know what kind of recovery they're going to have? What do you tell them? I usually tell them nine months to a year to really know, um, you know, and I explain to them kind of how long it takes for a nerve to recover and regenerate. Uh, one interesting wrinkle I'll add here is that probably for this case, like I did recently, I would probably use the, uh, uh, do a nerve transfer for the recurrent motor branch of the median nerve. So borrowing, uh, transferring the nerve from the uh, hypothenars that uh, Bertelli's described, certainly leaving the rest of the ulnar nerve in zone two alone, but finding a branch that goes to uh, the ADM and doing a nerve version of the of one of your favorite uh, tendon transfers, the Huber, uh, and transferring that over to the recurrent motor branch. I think you can get a lot of length out of your recurrent motor branch as you're neuralizing it off. And I'm doing a carpal tunnel release for this case anyway. So um, that helps move things along. I've seen recovery from that pretty quickly because you are pretty close to target. Um, and that will outpace the sensory recovery that you're going to get. Um, you know, I think you could also make a justification for not doing that because you are close enough to target to, to see some reasonable outcome. But I think there's uh, minimal downside to doing it. Um, and it's a synergistic type transfer. And this is end to side. No, no this is end to end. Oh, okay. I go end to end on this one. Um, you know, I guess... You know, if, uh, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it on this one. Love it. Love it. Uh, great conversation. Even though it was nerve, I enjoyed that. Yeah, sure you did. Sure you did. Why don't we talk about bones? You, uh, We ha recently had a, uh, well, first off, thank you, Andy, uh, for sending that in. Uh, super helpful. Hopefully this was a good discussion. I know that uh, the listserv uh, may have provided you some better responses than that, but uh, <laughs> hopefully we helped you out a bit there. Um, and then... Uh, we had a discussion recently about scaphoids and how to deal with them. And we talked about using, you know, dorsal approaches, but we didn't really talk about when you would go volar on a scaphoid. Yeah. So let's, let's do that. Um, first, I would say that I've not personally been super successful with percutaneous or limited volar approaches. Um, so for me, if we're going volar, let's start with indications. Why would you choose to go volar over dorsal? And I would say you would always try to avoid going volar because it's so simple to go dorsal. But when the indications are right, volar is an important technique that you got to have. Um, and you can expect really good outcomes. So what should we just pop back and forth? What are the indications to go volar for you? 
Yeah, so I mean, usually, honestly, most scaphoids uh, aren't coming in. Acute fractures aren't coming in with, you know, a quote, you know, the humpback deformity. Usually that's more in a, you know, a non-union setting or delayed diagnosis kind of setting. Um, so, you know, I, to me, that's usually the reason why I'm considering going volar is if I have a lot of flexion through the waist of the scaphoid and I need to correct that. I don't think you can get a lot of effective correction from the dorsal approach. You can get a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, so, you know, for me, dorsal is more when you're playing it where it lies or you got to do a little bit of correction. But if you have to do any meaningful correction, I go volar. How about you? Yeah, I think that's well said. It's typically a non-union uh, with a humpback deformity. And the other trick is where the fracture line is located. So if it's a proximal pole non-union, first of all, you're not going to have a humpback in most cases. Um, and you just definitely go dorsal waist and distal waist. You're much more likely to go volar, both for access and correction of the humpback deformity, as well as placing the screw in the right position. Because the more distal your fracture, the more important it is to have your screw running in a retrograde fashion from distal to proximal. Um, and right. I think that's basically it. That's why you go volar. Right, right. I think one of our partners had a case recently that was quite challenging, that it was a proximal pole in the setting of a prior malunion uh, through the waist, which all of that sounds incredibly challenging. Um, but yeah, I think you described it very well. Um, you know, usually with the proximal pole, you're not going to have that kind of humpback, uh, deformity that you would classically see with something a little bit more distal. Um, and then, you know, I think going, uh, going volar does make much more sense if you've got a more distal oriented fracture pattern. Yeah. And it's, it's not a complicated approach. Uh, it is an approach where you have to gain confidence because it's simply not an area where we work all that much, um, Maybe we can just briefly talk through the approach and then yeah, you're, 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 yeah, definitely you're in a hole, um, you know, and, uh, uh, I think getting the exposure is, is key. So how, how do you design your incision kind of talk me through how you do it? I would say the first, and those of you on YouTube can see the first non-intuitive piece is your scaphoid, tuber, scaphoid tuberosity is at your distal wrist crease and you push on it. It hurts whether or not your scaphoid is broken, but that's, that's your scapegoat tuberosity. That's where your screw is going to enter. So I make an incision, which is V-shaped. So it, it's oblique across the thenar eminence, and then it comes over the FCR tendon. Um, and I do use the FCR tendon sheath as part of the approach. And I sharply dissect down to the tuberosity, and I open the sheath. So how do you manage your, um, your FCR? Um, I typically, well, first of all, um, before you get to the FCR, sometimes you'll encounter that, tran that transverse branch of the radial artery contributing to your superficial arch. Um, and in that case, I just, if it's in the way, I don't mind cauterizing. Um, cauterizing. Yeah. Tying it if you want to be fancy. Um, <laughs> but I cauterize. Um, and then you you have your FCR tendon. So your FCR tendon is running right ulnar uh, to your tuberosity. And I just mobilize it, typically taking it more ulnar. And then your deep approach is through the radioscapho capitate ligament. And so you you cut that as you're cutting capsule as well. That's a real ligament, and it must be repaired. Um, and then you you have your you have your exposure. I will say that it's not quite that simple, and it's sort of a sharp dissection around the scaphoid, taking care of the cartilage. Obviously, you don't want to go too far radial and dorsal because you don't want to get into your blood supply. But it's straight volar using that tuberosity as your as your lighthouse. Do you use the um, do you keep the RSC together with the capsule? of a layer um, for your closure later and, and do you do any you have any tricks or pearls about how to be able to identify that later is it stout enough so that you know that to repair it on the way out or do you uh do you tag it with any suit or anything like that i haven't felt the need to tag it it's stout enough um to repair and i usually try to put two horizontal mattress two or three o sutures uh ethabon type sutures um there and i think that's more than sufficient i think it heals fine you just got to remember to repair it Right, right. And uh, what are your pearls in terms of the carpentry, in terms of getting, you know, dealing with your deformity, um, you know, and getting that back out to length and getting rid of the flexion deformity? Yeah, I think there's a couple different ways to approach it. I do think 062 Kirshner wires are helpful um, as joysticks just to place and pull apart. Um, and then you expose your non-union site, aggressive curatage, because you want to have good bone. Again, in the waist, you usually can get back to good bone with good bleeding and healing potential. Um, and you just have to prepare the bone ends uh, thoroughly rather than quickly. Right, right, right. And are you uh, are you of the mind state of taking down a tourniquet and looking at bleeding at the proximal end? Or is it just, you know, you know 
You know what you're seeing. You have faith. Yeah, just like I wouldn't do that for a proximal pull, I wouldn't do that for a waist. There are certain people who believe in it. I don't know. My decision about whether to use a vascularized graft or a non-vascularized graft is made before the surgery, and it's always not, almost always non-vascularized. So I do not believe in letting down the tourniquet. I think your next decision-making process is, are you going to use a structural interposition, or are you going to count on your screw to you know, help with the correction of the scaphoid humpback deformity. And if you're going to use, I'll just keep babbling for a second. If you're going to use bone, you have two choices in my mind. You're either going to use an iliac crest, uh, which is beautiful carpentry, has to be done well. I think it's the best bone in the body. I think it's just more conducive to healing. Or you're going to use a ruse type technique where you're using some cortical distal radius with some cancellus underneath it. Either of those are appropriate or neither of those is appropriate. My personal preference is just the screw. How do you think about it? Um, I like the Rousse. I, I hate going to the hip unless I absolutely have to. It, I mean, it hurts. You know, it, it just, you know, I actually had to have a conversation with somebody the other day about, you know, um, you know, whether we had to go to their hip or not. So I told them I tried to avoid that, but it already had just a radius autograph from somewhere else. So we had that conversation. Um, is there any role for allograft? Not for me. No. And I mean, look, the distal radius is so easy. It's right there. Um, no, I don't think there's any role at all. Yeah, I saw, I saw some of the modified Rousse techniques when I was in residency, because um, I think that uh, Scott Wolf has published on that uh, a few years back. And he so some of those cases ended up in that series. And I think it's a nice technique. It It is very just technically finicky and carpentry wise. You just got to get it right. But like you're saying, you know, just uh, that's your one shot at it. But I think that's a nice way to kind of maintain um, the... Uh, maintain the volar uh, volar correction and uh, and get it out to length and then the screw. I, I don't typically rely on the screw itself. How have you kind of evolved towards that? Uh, well, the screws are obviously sufficiently strong to count on that. I think it's a little more technical to depend on the screw. Don't get me wrong. The carpentry has to be excellent if you're depending on the bone for your correction. But in some ways, once you do that, the case is done. You know, you insert your graft and then you just put the screw down the center center or the best of your ability center center. If you're depending on the screw placement, then you have to do a couple of things. One, after your thorough preparation, I generally pack some cancellous bone in the deficit. Um, I then place a derotational kind of stabilizing k wire that needs to be pretty volar to prevent the scaphoid from collapsing. Then I place my longitudinal K wire over which I'll place my screw, uh, also somewhat volar, and then I place my screw. And so it's just more important that you get all of those steps exactly right if you're not going to depend on the bone graft to help with your position. Right. Do you ever leave your leave a K wire or your derotational wire or some other supplemental wire in addition to your um, to your retrograde screw? I have, but generally I find that one. Um, you know, mini size screw is sufficient. Meaning, um, I think if you're using small screws, you might need two screws, which I think a lot of people these days favor. I understand why some people do that. Uh, scaphoid plates are still being utilized. I have no experience with that. Uh, in general, one good screw to me uh, accomplishes our goals. Right. And I guess if I were to think of one indication for a scaphoid plate, this would be it in terms of, you know, correcting some crazy deformity, but uh, that has not been our experience. And if you have experience with a scaphoid plate and, and love it and would love to tell us, please, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am, you know, people talk a lot about whether you need to take down part of the trapezium to get access to the distal pole of the scaphoid to have your screw in the perfect trajectory. And absolutely, I think that that is a part of it. The question becomes, can you lift up your scaphoid? So if you have linked the proximal and distal poles with K-wires, can you put a Holman retractor or some kind of retractor and just lift up the whole distal scaphoid? And that can allow you good access. I think it can, but you have to be careful not to close down the humpback in the act right. of lift, lifting up. You've done so much work to get the carpentry. I right? just just nibble away part of the trapezium and get your ankle. I mean, it's just, it's just you know, you've done all that work. Why uh, Why put it at risk? Yeah, never heard of a single complaint for regarding removal of some of that trapezium. So I, I totally agree. And some people, if they are trying percutaneous, go right through the entire trapezium. And mm -hmm. I, again, I've never heard of an issue with that. So I'm not against it. I just personally haven't done that. So your post-op protocol is the same, pretty standard prolonged immobilization, uh, anything different than after a dorsal? 
No, it's, it ends up being six weeks of immobilization and then re removable brace. Uh, depending on various factors, I always quote eight to 10 weeks for sort of a waste non-union. Uh, there are certainly ones that take longer. Uh, the more distal you go, I absolutely believe the faster it heals, the younger the patient, the faster it has the potential to heal. So um, these should heal if you if you do your surgical job right. The one factor uh, I will say with a waste non-union, chronicity does matter. I think once you get to that four to five year time frame, uh, there's a little bit of science that says those are less likely to heal. More expectant management, so to say. Expectant management, that's exactly right. Um, and you mentioned on the earlier about, you know, repairing your RSC on the way out. I think that's something that probably should be restated. That's important. But there you go. Volar scaphoid. Not as exciting as the median nerve, but exciting. Well, nonetheless. It's exciting to some of us. Different strokes. I love it. That was fun. We hit both uh, sportsy and uh, nervy topics and uh, uh, I had fun with it. All right. Great. I guess we need a congenital topic soon. I can't believe I just said that. Yeah. I said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right. Have a good care. day.